are you? Good, fine. How are you? Good. Thank you for taking the time. Sure. All right. So um, I'm a writer for Jersey Jazz Magazine, and I have this podcast that does quite well. So we're going to be featuring you there. Um, and essentially, uh, the article is about the Middlesex County Jazz Festival and your inclusion there. Uh, can you talk about what you're going to be doing there and the band that you're going to be playing with? When is that? In September? Yes. Yeah, so I have it as September 28th in New Brunswick. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah, so I'll be bringing a quartet. Um, my uh, usual quartet is uh, Lenny White on drums, Steve Wilson on um, alto, and um, Brandon McCune sure. on piano. And is it uh, original compositions? Will you guys be playing standards that that day? We'll play our repertoire, which is uh, uh, basically original compositions of mine. Mm -hmm. Understood. Cool. So um, I just recently finished watching uh, the documentary film on you, and uh, it answered a lot of questions for me, but <laughs> it also raised quite a few that I was hoping uh, you can answer if possible. Uh, first of all, the nickname Buster. How did you come? How did you get that nickname? You know, I don't know. Yeah. I really don't know. Really? I've had it ever since uh, I can remember. And um, I asked my mother once, uh, how did I get that nickname? And she said, well, I wanted to, we wanted to call you um Chuck, but you were too skinny. Mm. You were too skinny for Chuck. And um my father said that uh he had a friend that was a bartender at uh, uh one of the uh main jazz clubs in uh Philadelphia. I think it was Peps, and he said his name was Buster. And, um, you know, and he laughed and, uh, but, you know, I never got any kind of an answer, you know, well, you know, we sat down and we thought about it and, uh, you know, uh, I mean, Buster was sort of like a, uh, a term, uh, you know, hey, Buster. Right. You know, we, regardless of what a person's name was, you know, you, uh, like a smart aleck or something, I don't know. Yeah. But um, that's been my name ever since I can remember. Hmm. Okay. Now, your father, uh, Charles Sr., I know from the film he was a musician. Um, was that his profession? Was he a pro That was his profession, yeah. Oh, it was. Okay. I wasn't sure. And uh, in the household, was it strictly jazz or was there other... Uh, like classical influence as well that you were listening to? It was strictly, uh, mostly jazz, yeah. I mean, I would hear a classical uh, thing every now and then, but uh, my father was a, a lover of jazz music, and uh, that, was his genre, that was his genre. He would have, uh, you know, jam sessions or rehearsals at the house, and... Um, uh so i would i would sit and listen to these guys play and it was, was definitely something that i decided i wanted to do it seemed so it seemed so glamorous and the music was just so um appealing right right and then when you did uh finally express a desire to play the bass i know uh he was your teacher was it a very formalized way of learning through him? Formal um, in the sense that um, he had his way of doing things. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, he had his way of um, uh, making sure that uh, I did things correctly. And uh, he was very thorough. 
He was very thorough and uh, and and methodical, and uh, you know to the point where um, I I couldn't escape anything. I couldn't escape the the the, the uncomfortness of it. Uh, uh, it. You know you know the phrase no pain no gain. Yes, very he, much. So. He never used that phrase, but that was definitely his ideology. Mm. You know, so uh, like a very definitive, very strong type of personality, you would say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Right? Um, so from him, because when I watch you play and I show it to my students often, it's almost like uh, your technique, just the way you hold the bass and your everything about the way you play is almost textbook. I would imagine part of that was was from his training. All of it was from his training. Yeah. Every single bit of it. Interesting. So talk about, if you could, um, Camden, growing up in Camden at the time. What was Camden like, and did it have a music scene, or is it mostly uh, a Philadelphia kind of a scene? Well, Camden uh, uh, was like um, connected with Philadelphia. Philadelphia was a great jazz scene. And uh, Camden was sort of a subsidiary of that. And at the same time, uh, it had its own uh, um, uh, bulging, or I would say, um, you know, musicians that made a living just playing in Camden. Right. And um, you know they were they were uh, uh, many clubs and opportunities to um, to express yourself and and uh, get training. And um, my earliest training uh, was from my father sending me out on on uh, on gigs with the guys that he played with. Right. You know, or taking me on gigs where he would play drums and I would play bass. Interesting. And and, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, I was I was gonna ask if and were the older musicians were they were they widely accepting of you, uh kind of learning in that way in a in a session kind of situation? You know, that that kind of thing became apparent very early on. You know, there was nothing selfish about um, this music or the musicians who played this music. They were all accepting and, um, you know, if you wanted to know, they would show you. And uh, so the answer is, um, uh, they all, you know, treated me as well. You know, they 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 loved my father, mm. and uh, they saw that I had you know aptitude, and uh, they were more than willing to to give me everything they had. It's a beautiful thing, yeah. And it seems like that tradition still somewhat carries through today. Not somewhat, it is. I mean, it's the it's the core of of uh, what we do, and um, I think by by association or by uh, by the 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 whole uh, democracy of the music, uh, you don't hold back. You know, there are no secrets. You know, in the the in meaning that uh, the secrets are not secret. Mm. You know, if you really want, if you really want to know what's going on, uh, you know, this, this jazz community will, will, will teach you. And, 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 and in an honest fashion. Yeah. Yeah. I, I even noticed, uh, I mean, so I host several jam sessions in the area. And uh, yeah, the warmth. I mean, we have kids 
13, 14, 15 years old who try to come up and, and learn the music and learn the repertoire. And everyone is so, uh, so accepting and so, so nice to, to these young individuals. And, and it's, it's, it's a great thing with this music, really. I agree. Um, so if we, if you could, for a moment, uh, you talk about your time with Stitt and Ammons, uh, I would, I would imagine during your formative years, really, and you're pretty candid about their habits and how you, and how you avoided those habits. Was there any temptation for you to kind of, to go along with what they were doing? None whatsoever. How did you avoid it? Um, uh, there was no temptation and um, I never thought about that, but um, uh, I, I, think, I think it was from my father's training and from the conversations uh, that we would have. And he was, my father was, was bluntly honest. And um, he would, he would, in no uncertain terms, tell me what to do and what not to do. And um, if he felt like it was necessary to explain a why, he would explain a why. And if he felt like he didn't want to explain a why, he would just say, because I say so. Right. You know? And I, 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 um, didn't question anything that my father said. <laughs> you know, uh, as you saw in the documentary, I, I, I said that um, you know when um, when he when he accepted um, uh, when he decided to teach me um, and. Uh, uh, you know, the blisters started coming. Sure. You know, and the pain in my left hand. And I um, would entertain the possibility of maybe giving up. Um, uh, that would last only for uh, uh, <laughs> uh, a quick uh, second because. Um, I, I was afraid my, that my father would kill me if I gave up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so uh, not only was he, you know, uh, thorough, you know, but he, he knew how to use the, the power of fear. And uh, so I wouldn't dare um, question what my father told me. And if my father told me, this well then that's the way it was going to be mm -hmm. that doesn't say i was a model child you right. know, because uh you know i i i pulled against the i pulled against the 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 the, the strings of of of, uh, of danger um quite often but um uh when when I got out on the road, um, the uppermost thing in my mind was the things that he told me to avoid and to look out for. And everything that he warned me against, I experienced. Yeah. So I, I knew I knew what to do when uh, you know when these experiences appear mm -hmm. so like uh, uh interestingly so i mean i know some people who have studied with you and they only have admiration for the way you teach the way you instruct would you say your teaching style differs from that of your father's or is there is it similar <laughs> you know i would say it comes directly from my father and um the only difference would be that I try not to not to scare him like my father <laughs> scared me. <laughs> I, I try to be a little more gentle, mm. you know. But you know, um, uh, you know. I mean, if you if you talk to 
those who I teach, you know, I don't know what kind of words they use, but uh, I'm very strict in that, in that um, if you want to get to where you want to get to, then, you know, there's a, a certain strictness that you must have about your input. Right. It ain't gonna come. It ain't gonna come. You know, from the ethos. You know, what what, you, what you're going to see and what you're going to experience, as far as is going to be the result of of what you put into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and <laughs> the words I often hear is uh, caring, nurturing, but also um, not. So, I've never heard the word demanding from from any of your students, but uh definitely uh you know they they want to produce for you and, and there's a certain level of uh obviously respect but they do say you know it's not easy we're studying with you is you have to do the stuff you know yeah because uh i don't i don't i don't i don't i don't know any shortcuts yeah me neither i don't know any shortcuts and I don't want any shortcuts, and I'm sure not going to try to uh, create shortcuts for my students. Right. Yeah, yeah I agree. And I, and I mean, even in the doc, you talk about the infinite possibilities of like discovery on the base. I mean, it's it's almost real cr crazy to think of this thing with four strings and the big piece of wood, essentially. Mm -hmm. And yet, there's all these infinite possibilities you know um and you say you still even to this day you're you're still discovering new things on the instrument oh of course i mean there's not a there's not a a, a, a instance where i have my bass in my hand that I'm, I'm not discovering something and you know new information is always there and how to do what you think you know better those possibilities are always there mm. so you know it's like it's like uh you know how how close how, how what's what's the you know the 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 uh journey from here to a star i mean you know you can look up in the sky and you see the star and it don't look too far away, you know? Yeah. But um, the journey is endless. It's endless. So why should we try and put a limit on something that we're, we're, we're trying to explore that's endless? And, you know, and the, 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 the what's endless about it is is that there's always possibilities. And, and and all of these, this whole endless nature and this, all these possibilities exist within us. So, I mean, that that's inspiring in itself to me. Mm. Um, I can always go beyond uh, um, where I am at this moment. Yeah, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, so true. So uh, in terms of like going back a little ways about uh, teaching and, and uh, studying school in a music situation, I, I believe you attended uh, Combs College of Music for some time. Is that correct? Yeah, but you know, um, the way I did it, um, I studied um, individually with a uh, a real master at that school. His name was Wiggins. And um, uh, he was, he was a genius. He was someone that I would um, classify as a genius. Um, he always, he was always finding new ways to do something. And he was one of the first um, who started um, um, putting music or uh, adding computer hmm. 
music. And um, uh, he taught me, he taught me things that, uh, uh, you know, like terms that I, I never even knew, like syntax and uh, um, uh, he would show me things, you know, um, that were obvious only if you allowed yourself to see the simplicity. Mm. And um, uh, so I, you know, and I would, I would study with him uh, when I would come back in town because I was, you know, I was I was on the road and and working uh, with with people at that time. By that time, I think I was I was still with Sonny Stitt and Gene Ammons, and um, so um, I think I I studied with him until he basically retired, and he, he took me on my first. Uh, New Year's gig mm. pay, and paid me $50. Right. And I was thrilled. I got paid $50 to play a gig, man. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh so he was he was my he was my champion. Mm. So uh, Wiggins was his last name, Professor Wiggins. Yeah, Professor mm. Wiggins back for that. Interesting. So um, then for a while there, it seemed like you were like the go-to basis for all the most well-respected singers. Like, was that was after Stitt and Ammons, I believe. Is that correct? Where mm -hmm. you were starting? Okay. So did you, um, to, could you actually just- But you uh, know, but you know um, uh, while I was still in high school, um, I uh, went out on the road with the, um, or yeah, I started touring with uh, Dakota Staten. Yeah, mm -hmm. and um, uh, was it was that was that before Gene Ammons and Sonny Stitt or after? I guess I think it was before, or around. I know around that time because mm -hmm. um, after Dakota Staten, and then I started working with Betty Carter. Sure. And um, uh, uh, it seemed as though, I don't know, um, what I found out from what singers told me, people like Betty Carter and Sarah Vaughn and, and uh, Carmen McRae and Nancy Wilson, they all said the same thing. And that was that they listened to the bass player first. Yeah. You know, and what they require is a good bass player. A good bass player that that knows how to to um to uh uh be the 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 uh, GPS mm. the radar you know who Anybody else can, in the band can get lost, but the bass, uh, you know. But if the, the bass player is should be such that listen to the bass player, and you'll always know where you are. Right. You know. So, because um, all of these these singers, uh, they love to do, you know, a chorus or, or two. Of whatever song they're singing with just the bass. Yeah. Mm. You know? And uh uh so I, I learned a lot from that that kind of responsibility and uh uh that requirement that um was innately mine uh because of the by nature of the role that I play in the band. And uh um and the other thing was to do it all in tune. You right. know, there was yeah. no flexibility on that. You got to do it all in tune. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think I, I remember you mentioning something about Sarah Vaughn had such phenomenal ears that if you were slightly out of tune, you would know about it. Oh, you would know about it. You yeah. would know about it. And I determined early on that I was never going to have her, you know, have to turn around and look at me funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Definitely. So um, so during the time, I think you were working with, uh, maybe it was, uh, I forget who you were working with at the time, but you were intermittently working with Miles on a break. And um, you had discussed that Miles had asked you to to join his band. Um, and it seemed like, and maybe I'm projecting here, but it seemed like if all things were equal or possibly you you do, you were somewhat desirous to maybe creatively, maybe that would have been a, a move you might have wanted to do. I'm not sure. Well, I was with Nancy Wilson at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, Nancy had moved her operation uh, from New York to California. And um, this was in 1967, I believe it was. And in 1965 is when she made this move. And I got married in 1965 and Nancy was my wife's uh, maid of honor at oh. our wedding. And um, as a wedding gift, she, she footed the bill to move us from New York to Los Angeles. A nice gift. And um, so uh, this was in 1970 when I, 67 when I got the call uh, from Herbie Hancock uh, asking me to, you know, tell me that Miles wanted me to join the band. And um, uh, Nancy uh, had, um, fortunately, taken a five-week sabbatical. And Miles had a tour that was going to last for five weeks. And it was like, you know, the perfect slot, the perfect opportunity, the perfect time. And, um, but the thing that was not perfect was the fact that um, I was in a pretty good um financial situation at that time because Nancy was paying me um, every week whether we worked or not. Mm -hmm. So I was on a, a retainer. Right. And, um, and so when I went out with Miles for those five weeks, I was still being paid by Nancy also. So okay. You know, so when Miles asked me to, to stay with the band, I mean, it was a tough decision. I mean, you know, I I I wanted to do nothing. <laughs> of course, that's what I wanted to do, you know, but um, I had a house in Granada Hills. I had a yellow kink, uh, a, a Stingray Corvette. Nice. You know? I was making good money. Nancy's itinerary at the every year, beginning of every year, we had an itinerary for the whole year. Mm. You know? And um uh everything, you know, ran like clockwork and uh it was just hard to give that up. You sure. know, that's what I told Miles. I said, I said, man, where were you when I needed you? <laughs> it's always you the know. case <laughs> but uh you know you know but that experience was was magical you know i mean um it it, uh, it was something that that stuck with me and and shaped my perception of things uh for the rest of my life that five week those five weeks those five weeks yeah now was that was Tony Williams in the band at that? Who was in the band with you at that time? Tony Williams, uh, Wayne Shorter, right? Hancock. So where was um, where was Ron Carter at this at this time? Was he not 
playing with him? Ron was um, busy with things in New York. Um, um, and I mean, I never found out really, you know, why he didn't make that tour. But um, uh, that's, that's the only part I understand, that he was busy. Mm. And, you know, uh, the band had been together for a while. You know, this was in uh, 67. Right. And I think they had been together, what, since... Um, 64, I believe. If not yeah, 63, 64. And, you know, nothing lasts forever. And, uh, and because shortly after uh, my stint with Miles... You know, then Herbie left, you know, and Tony left. Uh, in fact, uh, I think Tony left uh, maybe before Herbie. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so, you know, but I mean, it was it was the ideal moment for me, the ideal time for me. Because, uh, you know, like I said, Nancy had a, you know, a, a, a tenure that was set for the year. And um, any other time of that in, that, in that year, I would not have been able to do, do a tour with Miles. Yeah. Busy. You know, and then also by that time, you know, I was very busy because, um, when I went out to LA in 65, because of Nancy, you know, um, I started working with the Hank Hampton Halls. Mm. And Halls and Donna Bailey and I had a trio. Um, uh, I quickly got into the um, studio scene. I was being called for, for jingles and, and record dates all the time. And also, I joined the Jazz Crusaders. Right. You no, know? and um, uh, you know, musicians that came came out to California, you know, for part of their tour, you know, they would call me, um, Sweets Edison and Eddie Lockjaw Davis and uh, um, Betty Carter also. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, to to do their to do to work with them in LA. So so I was busy. It was it was it was great. I had I had my cake and I was eating it too. You know. Yeah, yeah. So it's um it's interesting because I I just uh, coming out next month is my biography on Ray Brown, and um, there seems to be a lot of similarities with with you moving to the West Coast and doing some studio work and I know you and Ray had a, a connection somewhat. Can you talk about uh Ray Brown and your connection with him? Yeah, so he when he left um Oscar Peterson he moved out to LA. And of course when Ray Brown came to LA they gave him the keys to the city. Yeah. And um uh you know I got to know him uh very well. And, you know, I had met him, of course, earlier, you know, in, in different places. And um, uh, when he couldn't make a recording date or a movie call, he would call me and send me. And uh, uh, so I sort of became uh, his number one sub there for a while. Yeah. You know, which was a great position to have. Right. Um, in terms of like, was was Ray Brown? I know you've talked about Petterford and um, as an influence, uh, and Chambers was was Ray Brown an influence on you? <laughs> uh, a resounding yes. Okay. <laughs> you know. I mean, he was the he was the quintessence of uh, what playing the bass is all about. Right. So you know, yeah, definitely. I mean, Ray Brown 
I would listen to Ray Brown sometime. And I remember we were on a jazz cruise together and uh, Ray Brown had his trio and uh, uh, so whenever his trio was playing, um, if I wasn't playing at the same time, I would go and listen to Ray. <laughs> and I remember listening to Ray one night, he said, and after we finished, I uh, went back to my cabin and uh, when I walked in, my wife looked at me and I and she said, what's, she said, what's the matter? And I said, I got a little headache. And she said, yeah. And she says, you, you've been down there listening to Ray Brown. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'll do it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, I had the uh, great pleasure of uh, hearing him uh, several times and talking to him very briefly a few times. And uh, uh, I mean, just those few moments, what an experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow. So um, then like jazz starts to move into this sort of fusion era for some time with the electronic instruments and some rock influences as well. You become a little bit of a part of that playing some electric bass. Um, when did you pick up the electric and how did that come to be? I think, um, uh, well, I had some uh, record dates with um, Harold Mayburn. Oh, sure. And Hal Mayburn wanted me to play electric on some of these dates. And I did. Um, and also, but this is what happened. I was um, doing a lot of uh, jingles, mm -hmm. TV commercials and stuff. Uh, that, that was, that, that business was very uh, lucrative. Mm -hmm. uh, in those days here in New York, it's dried up completely now. Mm -hmm. but, um, uh, and many of these dates required electric bass. So I started playing electric bass uh, to be, uh, to not be rejected um, on these calls. You know, because the, 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 these calls were very, very strict and you know, um, in New York, we had an answering service. Uh, and, you know, if, if a, a producer needed you for a jingle, he'd call his answering service, and his answering service would get in touch with you. Mm. you know, and um, there was no, you know, if you couldn't do it, then, you know, the next guy got the call, you know, and... Uh, uh, you you made it a habit of not refusing these calls because uh you know if, if you if you get known for not being available well they're not even gonna try you yeah you know so um in order to be available and um answer the call um then I kept uh both instruments tuned up and ready to go, mm. you know? And then, um, of course, when I joined Herbie, that was uh, uh, actually 1969. And uh, uh, I eventually, you know, Herbie got into the electric piano and um, uh, it, was, it was a very smooth, a very smooth um, uh, move, you know, from acoustic to electric. And with, with the electric and acoustic um, existing, you know, together. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started playing more uh, electric bass. I think on the record M1 Yeah, uh, I played quite a bit of electric. So, you know, and then, uh, so on the gigs, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd bring my electric bass and my acoustic bass and 
switch interchange uh, interchange uh, uh, from one to the other according to the tunes that we play. You know, but the, you know the thing about I I and in those days, um, you know, I had something to say on the electric bass. You know, but then the electric bass uh, start started finding a spot of its own. Yeah, you know, and guys started playing and slapping and doing all kind of stuff that uh, um, I, I was I was not so interested in um, putting that kind of time into the electric bass because the electric bass never you know I never really liked it <laughs> right <laughs> you know <laughs> because because the intricacies and the you know and the human element of it just doesn't exist for me like the acoustic bass yeah you know and uh uh so to this day, um, that's still how I feel about the, the electric bass. Still, you still have one? Oh yeah. But you know, don't play it much. I have a few of them. Yeah, but I, I haven't I haven't played the electric bass in in years. Mm. Yeah, interesting. So that uh, transition to Herbie, uh, you were with him quite for quite some time, and through some kind of different changes with that within his music at that time. Um, can you talk about sort of just your connection with him and, and, and the bands you worked with, with him? Well, you know, the, um, what became known over time, uh, as the M1 DC band, of course, started out as the Herbie Hancock, um, sextet. Mm -hmm. Uh, we always had um, a three-piece front line, and uh, uh, so it was a sextet. And, and then um, at some point, um, we added uh, um, uh, Dr. Gleason, who was a, a, a Moog synthesizer player. I remember when mm -hmm. we started with the, you know, he would it would take him a, about a week to program everything. <laughs> yeah, right. Because that was the, you know, we started out with the Moog synthesizer, and that was about as as big as his whole studio. Yeah. Um. Uh. So you know, um. But what was your your question? Just, just uh, Herbie in general, working with him and and uh, your remembrance of those bands. Yeah, so um, you know, and then when when that band um, came to a, to a close, I think it was in nineteen seventy three. And then Herbie, you know, um, kept moving with uh, this thing called Headhunters. Right, right, monumental, yeah. And then, um, uh, and then uh, Herbie and I got together again um, uh, to do these summer tours, and um, it would always be um, the Herbie and Cock Trio, which was Herbie and myself and Al Foster, yeah, and we'd get a a tenor player or an alto player to do the tour with us for a summer tour. One time it was Greg Osby. Another time it was Branford Marcellus. Another time it was, um, uh, what's his name? The tenor player. Um, he and his uh, uh, trumpet player, what's his name? Or is his brother, the tenor player, passed away? Oh, um, yes. Uh, Brecker? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Michael Brecker. 
And uh, so we, we did these things. And, and then, uh, uh, and then the trio was Herbie and Tony Williams and myself. And um, that lasted for a while. And, uh, you know, and, and then eventually, you know, then Herbie, Herbie and I, you know, I started doing other things and Herbie was doing other things. And um, we sort of like drifted just drifted apart as far as uh, any kind of regularity in our playing together. Right. Okay, cool. I know I've kept you for a while, so I, I only have another question or two, if that's okay. Um, so your transition to, I don't think if my timeline is correct, your first album as a leader was mid seventies. Um, so it took quite some time for you to record as a leader, I think. Can you talk about yeah, that transition? I think it was 1975. Um, and the first album was uh, uh, for, for um, Muse, for Muse Records, mm -hmm. uh, called Pinnacle. Pinnacle. Um, and then, um, so I went on to make a few more records with... Uh, with Muse, I think I did about about five records for them or something like that. You know, um, but, was it? Uh, go ahead. Uh, sorry. I was going to just ask if it was uh, if it was a different mindset for you being the leader after having you know worked with some of the greatest leaders in jazz history. Well, um, for me. I mean, that was the way to become a leader, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, you know, the kind of thinking these days, you know, you want to strike out and want to start out as a leader. You know, um, I, 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 I see um, innate flaws in that kind of thinking because, um, I was brought up um, with the understanding uh, that uh, to become, you know, a master in what you do, you have to serve an apprenticeship. You know, you don't just jump out, you know, and all of a sudden you know how to do it. You know, mm -hmm. the, it, there's, there's a real value in, in, in an apprenticeship which um, I think a lot of um, uh, younger guys um, miss this opportunities that they miss, and um, I mean, there's been there's been many examples of those who didn't really serve the apprenticeship, and um, their their star. Or the light, you know, didn't burn too long, mm. you know? Yeah. I always tell my students, I said, you know, remember, you know, the, the winner in this marathon is the one who finishes last. Yeah. <laughs> That's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's very funny. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, man. Um, great. So, um, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about is your spirituality, um, and your connection to chanting and Buddhism. Uh, when did that start for you? That started in 1972. Uh, my youngest sister, um, she was, um, uh, she was uh, the initiator of all of this. She started chanting. And um, my wife and I were separated during that time. And she introduced my wife. And then my wife and my sister introduced me. And um, then uh, 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 I introduced Herbie and uh, Larry Coriel, Harold Ann, mm. 
Richard Davis and a whole bunch of people. And uh, so it's been going on. I've been chanting since 1972. Wow. Is it a daily, something you do daily? Something I do daily, you know? Just, just as I breathe in and I breathe out on a regular daily basis, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's the best It's the best thing that I could have ever uh, uh, introduced in my life. Wow. And, it's just fantastic. Interesting, yeah. All right, cool. I think I got most of it. The one, th this is a, a little bit offbeat, but uh, there's one record I, in specific, I want to ask you about, only because I've done so much research on Ray. And there's a record that you play with him on called Something Personal. I don't know if you remember that. Jack record. Wilson. Yeah. Do you yeah, have any reference to that? Ray plays. Ray plays uh, cello on that. Right. Yeah. What do you remember about that session, if anything? Um, I just remember that we did it, and um, I can visualize, you know, the studio that we were in, and um, uh, just watching Ray, you know, play the the cello. It was it was great to 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 be, you know, on a record with him. You know, and um, it was interesting, interestingly enough, um, um, I don't remember too much about him playing the cello. I don't mm -hmm. think I was too impressed. <laughs> right. You know, but uh, that was Ray Brown. And um, I was glad to have that as part of my, my uh, experience. Yeah. And similarly, I think with Ron Carter, you recorded some. I don't know if he was playing cello on those ones. So I can't remember. No, well, with Ron Carter, we had a band. Oh, it was, a, it was an actual band. Okay. Yeah, we had a band uh, for, for about five years. You know, Ron played piccolo bass. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. yeah. With uh, Kenny Barron on piano and Ben Riley on drums. Started out uh, first uh, Larry Willis on piano and Ben Riley. And then uh, Kenny Barron. Yeah, that band was was uh, together. What uh, I think from seventy five to uh, was it or seventy four something like that for about four or five years. And uh, we did a few records. Peg Leg. We did. Um, uh, uh, I forget the name of these records. But we did about four or five records. I didn't realize it was an actual band. I know the, I know about those records, and Peg Leg is the one that comes to mind uh, as well. Um, but you've never had no desire to play the, the jazz cello or the piccolo bass or anything? Well, I have a piccolo bass. In fact, like, uh, uh, the bass that, the, that's in the... Uh, the furthest from me mm -hmm. uh, in in the in the cover, yeah, uh, is a piccolo bass. Okay. And uh, uh, the guy that made a uh, piccolo bass for Ron, he also made a piccolo bass for me, and I've used it on a few albums. In fact, one of them I used, I used, I played piccolo bass on this album called Dreams Come True. Okay, I'll check that out. And um, I think another one. And that's, is it just tuned the same as a bass and octave higher? I've never played a piccolo bass. No, interestingly, it's uh, it's tuned a fourth above. It's tuned um, C, G, D, and A. Okay. You know, and, and when my father um, decided to teach me the bass, uh, he had two K bases, mm. and they were both tuned C, G, D, and A, because his his hero was Slam Stewart. Yeah, mm -hmm. he tuned his bass C, G, D, and A. And so when my father decided to teach me, of course, he took one of his bases and and uh, tuned it. Um, you know the the 
traditional uh, tuning G, D, A, and E. And, uh, and then when, when uh, uh, this guy, Fred Lyman was his name, made uh, this piccolo bass for me, you know, it occurred to me, wow, now, you know, it's sort of like full circle. I got a now I'm playing a bass, you know, the way my father did. G, yeah. I mean, C, G, D, and A. Right. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. And then finally, my my final question to you. Uh, obviously, you have the doc, but have you ever considered uh, an autobiography or a biography? Uh, yeah, I've considered it. Um, and hopefully I get to it <laughs> before it's too late. <laughs> yeah. Because I think I think that would definitely be uh, of interest to the public for sure. Mm. All right, listen, I really appreciate you spending the time. It's a pleasure talking to you. My pleasure, Jay. All right, thanks again, and I'll I'll send you over the uh, the final product when it's done. Okay. All right. Take so care. I see you're a bass player. Yeah. So I teach bass at uh, Monmouth University, um, mm -hmm. and one of your former students was a student of mine, Paul Kafari. I don't know if you yeah, remember. Paul. Yeah. And he used to. So I'm talking to you from my. I have a teaching studio here. Uh, mm -hmm. where we teach uh, about 250 kids a week, or I shouldn't mm -hmm. say kids, students a week. So yeah, do we, I do a lot of gigs and uh, mostly in the New Jersey area. Mm -hmm. and, uh, doing the whole where are you located? I'm in Monmouth County. So I'm in Howell, New Jersey. Oh, mm -hmm. So I play a lot in Asbury and Red Bank um, all over. And there's some, some fine musicians around here for a while. Norman Simmons was living here. I was playing with him a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, just doing the thing. Great. Yeah, and then I do the and I write a little for downbeat and uh and then the and then the books like the Ray Brown biography and stuff. Right, right. Yeah. I'm good for you. Thank you. All right, man. Thank you so much. All right, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, no.